good to see everyone. We want to open in prayer. We're in a new book, Colossians chapter 1. And so let me let me open us in prayer and we'll get started. Father, thank you. And Lord, we know that really with just one of these chapters, we've got plenty. But Lord, you've given us so much more than we need. So we can really round out our knowledge of you, Lord God. You've t you've you've given us abundantly more than we need, Lord God. So thank you for that, Lord God. And uh, we want to open our minds, help us to do that, and be filled with the word of God and presence of God and the power of God today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, let me uh, get started here. We're going to, as I said, go into chapter one of Colossians. And uh, the book opens up uh, normally with what's called the prescript. Verse one, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. We've talked about that by the will of God. We've talked about that. And he includes Timothy, our brother. And uh, you can picture kind of Paul sitting there writing this letter with Timothy next to him. Or maybe Timothy's writing it. Who knows? But, you know, they're 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 there. And uh, Paul was close to Timothy. And then verse 2, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Now, you know, it was kind of a pain uh, to write a letter, to get the paper and the ink and all that stuff. So I'm sure anytime anybody got a letter, they were happy to get one. I'm happy to get a letter that's handwritten today. It's pretty rare. <laughs> so I'm sure they received this and they they were real excited to get it. Verse three, Paul goes on. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. So it's common that Paul opens with a, a word of thanksgiving. It was common to open with saying, you know, who the letter's from, who it's to, and then have a thanksgiving. And then Paul weaves in prayer here right away. And normally Paul would start with say, I give thanks, but he says we. So we know it's at least him and Timothy. Maybe there's a group of others, but there's um, more than Paul that are thankful for the Colossian church. Verse 4, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. So um, they heard of their faith. He says, since we heard of your faith. They heard it from this guy, Epaphras, which we'll talk about in verses 7 and 8. So Epaphras was with them. He came down and he was talking about them. And the report is encouraging that they're living out their faith and, and how we want that for people, all people, but especially for our kids, for our brothers and sisters, for our families, those we really love. And Paul gets this report, and it's a very encouraging report. They're living out their faith, and they're loving the other believers. And Paul is giving thanks for that. That really sums up what we really want to be doing. We want to live out our faith and we want to love the people around us. And, and we can give thanks for that. Verse 5. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. So he says, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Um, we just, I read through how in Philippians, Paul, just every chapter over and over, he's looking to the future, the book of life, heaven, and he's doing that here too. Um, Paul always seems to have a forward look, a look to the future. And because he looks ahead, that's what he bases his life on now. And he's reminding us here that our current salvation and the blessings we have today is not all there is. It includes way more than we have right now. Right now, we say, well, I'm kind of happy. I've got a house, I guess, and some family, and I'm going to church, and I'm, I'm pretty good. But Paul is saying, look, you got to look to the future. You've got way more than you have right now, but it's waiting for you in the future. 
So included in our salvation is a bright and beautiful future just waiting for us. Paul says, it's laid up for you. <laughs> I like that. And so the word hope, Elpis, is an expectation of something. So Paul's saying we have an expectation uh, of something laid up for us in heaven. Um, and what can we expect? It's, it's there. It's literally put away for us. It's stored for us. It's reserved for us. God has set it aside for us, and it's sitting there in heaven. When we step into heaven, there's going to be our package there. It makes me think of Christmas as a child. I knew it was coming. I knew Christmas was coming. I couldn't wait for Christmas to come. I knew my parents had gifts for me. I didn't know what they were exactly, but I knew it was going to be good. But I couldn't find the gifts. They would hide them so well in the house. I didn't know where they were. <laughs> so I knew Chris was coming. I knew it was going to be good and I was going to get all kinds of stuff, but I didn't know what exactly it was. That's that's living in the excitement, the hope of the future. It's anticipation that brings an excitement to living. And maybe we're having a bad day today, but we can we can look at our future, and then even though we're having a bad day today, we get excited about life because we know Christmas is coming. My dad used to say, anticipation is better than participation. <laughs> In other words, when we're going fishing, we're going to plan a big fishing trip, and we'd be getting the rods out and getting everything ready. Like that was as much fun as actually throwing the line in and fishing. Well, maybe not, but close to it. So um, I don't think that's going to be true here because when we get in heaven, we're going to be having all kinds of fun, way more fun than here. But what he's saying, we can enjoy right now, today, this moment, because we know Christmas is coming. We know heaven is coming. And there's laid up for us this wonderful future. And uh, And so... God has given us a way to have joy in this life every day because of the hope he's given us for our future. And then, you know, he uses the word heaven, oranas, and that's, you know, it could just be the skies, but it's where God is. It's where the angels are. It's where the righteous dead are. So Paul, when he speaks of heaven, I really like the way he talks of it. He doesn't make a big thing of it necessarily. He just talks of it as a matter of fact. Of course there's heaven. Of course, it's very real. It's a very tangible place. It's like earth is real. But there's another parallel universe running at the same time as earth, and it's called heaven. And it's very real. And we just step into it through this process called death. So because heaven's very real, your hope is very real. You have a very real hope based on the reality of heaven. Verse 6. Which has come to you, just as in all the world also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, talking about the gospel, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. So he's talking about, he says, the gospel which has come to you just as in all the world. The gospel is a package. It's a packaged message. It was brought by Jesus, brought by his teaching, his life, his death, resurrection, the promises he gave us. It's this package. We find it in the New Testament. It's the gospel. And the package came to Colossians, um, first of all, by Epaphras, but now he's writing to them again and filling out that knowledge of God, the gospel. And um, since then, it's never stopped being delivered to the churches, this package. You know, we have this, um, and I don't know why I'm on a Christmas kick, but we have this, this story about Santa Claus. He goes and delivers these packages all around the world to all these kids. Well, just kind of replace that with us delivering the gospel message all around the world. We're not in a sleigh and we don't have reindeer, but it's very real, unlike Santa. But we deliver this gospel package to everyone we know. 
Now, some people are more bold with this than others. Some have it, find it very easy to do this. Others are very shy about it. But we have to. We carry this package called the gospel with us, uh, within us. It is transform us, and we have to deliver that package to others. That's the intention of the gospel. That's part of the gospel, is to deliver it to other people. And it says it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing. And we can see that. Paul was saying that back when he was writing this, but it's been happening ever since. It reminds us of Jesus in the parable of the sower. And others, the seed of the gospel fell on good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some 60, and some 30. So the Colossians heard the gospel, and now they're going to get this letter, and other people are going to come to them. And the gospel is going around the world. And ever since then till now, it's bearing fruit, it's increasing. And Paul brought the message to the whole Roman Empire. Now Paul's in Rome itself. And now he's talking to Caesar's household. And the gospel seed was definitely planted in Paul and then through Paul into, into most of the Roman Empire. And it was bearing all kinds of fruit. The Roman Empire basically became Christian. Phenomenal. And so he writes in Roman, Paul writes in Roman 10, 17, I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the earth. And aside from Paul, there's been so many others bringing the gospel message in Bible times, but also since Bible times. And the gospel seed has been planted in millions, I guess I could say billions at this point, <laughs> of hearts. And then he says, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. The Colossians firsthand saw the fruit and the growth in themselves. It started when they heard the truth of God, and by God's grace, they heard the gospel, and they were saved. Verses 7 and 8. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, and he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. So, the, the person, the Colossians, first heard this, this message of God's grace, the saving grace, the gospel, was from a guy named Epaphras. Now, Epaphras is, is an abbreviation of Epaphroditus, but they kind of think it probably is two different people. But he brought the gospel to Colossae. He was impacted by the by He was delivered to him, and then he delivered it to Colossae. And that's the way it works. He heard it. He received it. Now he had the gospel seed. Now he spread the gospel seed. And we have this really huge team doing this ever since. And today, I like to sometimes think of the 33,000 other Assembly of God ministers besides myself in, in America, in the United States. 33,000 ministers are credentialed just with the AG and tens and tens of thousands with the Baptists and other Christians. There's, there's a lot of people that this seed has been put in them and they have been called by God to deliver this seed as a full-time job in their lives. Uh, it, it's just beautiful. And that's how the gospel is spread. And he says in this verse, and he also informed us of your love in the spirit. So when Epaphras came back from Colossae to report to Paul how the church was doing, it was all good news. It was encouraging news. Now, he brought some other stuff, but that news stimulated Paul and Timothy to write back to the Colossian church. Verse 9. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Okay, so we're starting to get like deeper and richer in here now. It says, for this reason also, 
since the day we heard of it, the report that Epaphras brought us, we've not ceased to pray for you. It's always great to know someone's praying for you. And it's all right to tell them you're praying for them because that's what Paul is doing here. He's saying, hey, I'm praying for you guys. And, and Paul is reassuring them in that. He got the report. And now since he's read it, he's praying for them. I like to hear people are praying for me. I mean, if they really are, I love that. And it's okay to tell people that. So it says he hasn't ceased to pray. The word ceased, in other words, it's not necessarily that every moment of every day he continued to pray. The word means, uh, also it can mean restrained. So Paul hasn't restrained himself from praying. Like he's just like, any moment I have, I'm jumping in and I'm praying for the Colossians. Uh, and and so he he... He didn't restrain himself from praying. We all have a lot of stuff to do. Paul had a lot of stuff to do. And uh, but Paul didn't. But Paul would say, look, I got tons of stuff. I can do all of this. that, that. But every time I think you I'm jumping right in. I'm not stopping. I'm not restraining myself because I have to do other things. You're kind of a priority for me right now. And it sounds great to write about how I'm praying for you or read about how somebody's praying. But it's not always easy to do. It's not always easy to really get down and pray for somebody because things pull us away. But Paul really, really, really believed that God was listening to him and it was worth his time. And because he spent time asking God on behalf of these Colossians, he believed that the Colossians would be stronger and more knowledgeable and better for his prayer. That's a great example for us. So he says, to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. Now, I always preach on worship in that that is doing the will of God. It's like saying yes to God. And when I preach on it, the first question, the immediate question that comes back to me is, how can I know what the will of God is? It's a great question. And there's a long answer to it. But part of that answer is that ask somebody to pray for you that you would know what the knowledge of his will is. Paul says he's asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. So Paul's answering that question here. How do I know the will of God? Well, ask somebody who loves you. Would you pray for me that I could know the will of God for my life? And there's other factors like reading the word and so forth. And he says, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So they were dealing with all kinds of people promoting false knowledge. And they had to deal with these people. And in dealing with people who are bringing false things and lies about the gospel, the first thing we have to do is to simply know the truth. What is the gospel? We have to have spiritual wisdom and understanding before we can stand up for the truth. We've got to know the truth. And that's what Paul's prayer is, that you would know the knowledge of the will of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And that's exactly what we're doing right now in this Bible study. We're going through the new covenant because we need to know, um, we need to have the knowledge of his will. And we get it first and fo foremost by the Bible. That is authoritative. It is unquestionably the will of God. And I would say if Paul were alive and he knew Christian Life Church, he'd be saying, I'm praying for you guys that you'd be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Verse 10, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So we've got to understand the scripture. That's God's will. That's the first step in enabling us to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. We have to learn how we're supposed to walk through the scriptures. And that's the only place we find the, the, the how to walk. It's in the scriptures. So we could please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work. Um, our fruit is assessed by the word of God. 
not by what somebody else says. We're going to be judged by Jesus, not by our friends. So we bear fruit according to what the word, we put our efforts in the direction that the word tells us to. And then we're increasing in the knowledge of God by doing exactly what I'm doing right now. We're sitting here and I've been studying the word and now I'm pre I'm teaching the word and you're hearing it. We're increasing in the knowledge of God right now. And so um, uh, that's powerful for us. Life experience plays a part in this, but it could lead us wrong. It could lead us into lies. And so really the Bible, we center on the Bible when it comes to knowing God. Uh, it's worthy of the Lord. Of course, God is worthy of us knowing him, of knowing what he says, of pleasing him and bearing fruit. And then Paul's prayer goes on, verse 11, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. So he prays that they'd be filled with the knowledge of God and that they that we would be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. Paul didn't only pray for us knowledge, he prayed for us power. We would increase in the knowledge of God, but we'd be strengthened by his power. And we know because of this prayer, God doesn't just give us knowledge for our head. He gives us the power we need to, to walk in a manner that would please him. And so we need to pray that we'd be filled with the knowledge of God. And we need to pray and ask God for the power we need. We know we have that endowment of power from the Holy Spirit. We need to ask God for the Holy Spirit. We need this power. It says, for the attaining of all steadfast, steadfastness and patience. Oh, we've got to stand strong with all the demonic lies, the false knowledge that come against us. And not only the not only the demonic lies where the knowledge is a lie coming at us, but demonic power. There are spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. It's not just knowledge. It's power that's coming against us. And we need the knowledge of God and we need the power of God to come against the demonic knowledge and power. And God gives us this so that no matter what we're going through, we can stand steadfast in the Lord and we can be patient with the problems we're dealing with. See, the Stoics of that day, they believed they needed to be steadfast and patient, but they believed it was from within them. They just had to have the character. They just had to do it in themselves. Okay, I'm going to be steadfast and patient. But Paul here is saying, no, it's not just us. We ask God. God can give us the knowledge and the power we need so we can be steadfast and patient. And so Paul really believes in praying for one another. He believes in the power of prayer. And um, if someone's praying for me, it's more um, the avenue, the channel is wider that I could receive God's knowledge and God's power, and the, and it increases my chances that I'm going to make it through. <laughs> so pray for me. <laughs> pray, let's pray for one another. We need that. And he says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in, in, in light. So he's saying, thank God for this. And of course, God gave us his grace and it's an appropriate response to give thanks to God. He gave us what we need. He saved us, but then he gave us what we need, the power and the knowledge to walk in a manner worthy of him, to please him in all respects, to bear good fruit in every good work, to increase in the knowledge of God, to keep receiving his power. So we could be steadfast and patient. We could be joyful. Of course, we want to give thanks to God for this grace. And as Christians, we want to be characteristically thankful in our lives and grateful in our lives. We got this great inheritance coming to us. 
We don't want to be grumpy. Oh, yeah, there's Christian. Christians are always grumpy. I don't want to be around them. No, we as Christians want to be characteristically thankful and joyful because of God's grace and how he's qualified us for this inheritance. Verses 13 and 14. For he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. So Paul, like Jesus, recognized there's a domain of darkness. There's a structure of darkness. There's a kingdom of darkness. Jesus said, while I was with you daily in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this hour and the power of darkness are yours. Domain here is exousia. It means authority, ruling power. So this power of darkness is we what we've been set free from. We've been broken out of that. God grabbed you. He took you out from underneath the authority of these dark powers, and he brought you under the authority of his son who loves you. And so God created this world. Um, C.S. Lewis um, calls it that this world was created with certain rules. He calls it dark, deep magic. And the way the rules are is we couldn't have escaped that darkness. We couldn't have gotten ourselves out from underneath the authority of the domain of darkness. But, but that's what Jesus did. That's what God did for us. And he brought us into the light. He redeemed us. He forgave us. He washed away our sins, verse 15. And he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So Paul now, in, in this chapter, has prayed for them for the knowledge of God. But now Paul is presenting the knowledge of God. Paul prayed that they would have the knowledge of God. Now he's giving them some knowledge of God. <laughs> And they need this knowledge of God to stand up against the enemy of lies and the heretical teachings that they're being confronted with. So he's laying out some really good knowledge. So he sets the stage with prayer. He says, you've been redeemed and forgiven. You're empowered. Now here's some knowledge for you that you're going to need. And he presents Christ as God working through the history of the human race. And he goes through, into all these aspects. He says, first of all, he's the image of the invisible God. You need to know this. That's what Paul's saying. This is knowledge that's important to you. The nature and the being of God are perfectly revealed in Christ. These are invisible things in God, but they've been become visible through Christ. So John 1.18 says, no one's ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. That's what John said. Who is himself God? Jesus is God. And um, God made us in his image. And we are to aspire to be the example, the, the model of the perfect human being in Christ. But, but this is interesting. Because we were created in the image of Christ. Because we bear the image of Christ, no other part of the creation does. We bear the image of our creator. The son of God, God himself, could become incarnate as a man. He could become a human because human beings were made in the image of God, and he is God, and so he could come in that image as the perfect example to us becoming visible um, as an invisible God. All right. Firstborn of all creation. We have to look at this. Firstborn, prototokos, proto, like the first type or whatever. Like it, it's not firstborn in the sense like your firstborn child. He didn't, wasn't there before, but it, it means existing before. The one who existed before all creation. It doesn't mean that he was birthed at that time. So, um, okay, verse 16. Oh, I've got to read the rest. I'm going to just start in verse 16. For by him, all things were created, both in the heavens and the earth, visible and invisible, 
whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. Very clear here. <laughs> he created it. The scientists don't know what they're talking about at all when they think some weird thing brought this all about. It was God who created this, created the dirt, created life, created human life, and all the powers and principalities and angels that exist. It was created by God. They didn't evolve from nothing. Um, and the very important phrase, created by him and for him, this gives us our life purpose. We are living for him. That's why we have life. That's the answer to my biggest question when I got saved. That's why I got saved, because I finally understood I was living for God and I could know God. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church. And he's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which has proclaimed in all creation, which was pre proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up that which is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church I was made a minister, according to the stewardship from God, bestowed on me for your benefit, that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God, that is, the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of, it, of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. And for this purpose also, I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Wonderful. Um, a little over. Josh, you go ahead. Or... Yeah, the, the finished product we are is coming about as we walk in spiritual understanding and spiritual growth and so the beginning of this letter to the colossians paul is encouraging the church to continue in what they've been doing which is walking in the spirit and the faith that jesus is the first and he's the center and he's the reconciliation. He's everything. We place everything on him. And then by him, the spirit comes and guides us and gives us that breakthrough into a new life, breakthrough through the dominion of darkness that exists today and that exists in the world around us today. And we, by the power of Jesus, bring a kingdom of light into the world. It's by our living by our gentleness to people around us, by our love to those we meet, our kindness, our anti-self-centeredness, other-centeredness, is where we counter the kingdom of darkness. And as we do that, our lives are beginning to be built and constructed to completion. And that's, the, that's our call, that's our purpose, is to represent Christ and to bear the image of God properly, as Jesus did. And the 
in verse 24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. As we suffer and go through life for the sake of other people, because we will get burned and we will get hurt when you love other people, it will happen. It always does. People are broken and they need that love, but we don't, we, we never do it properly all 100% of the time. So Paul is bringing this up again. As he has in his other letters, he talks about his suffering and how he can rejoice in the suffering for others' sakes and the sharing of his body, this vessel that's being built, that's being grown, that as he gives it away, he gains. I know it seems counterintuitive, but as he gives his body for the sake of the church, for the sake of Christ's bride, he actually gains and is increased and blessed and grows for the kingdom of heaven and for rewards beyond this life. So it's okay to give. It's okay to lose out, to miss out on what the world has for us for the sake of the church and for the sake of people coming to God, that his church could be growing and made whole and made complete. So we find fulfillment in losing out on what the world has for us because we find our fulfillment in what God has for us, which comes later, which is the delayed gratification of, of this life of existence, which is the long-term investment. The short-term exists, but it's it does nothing. It has no return. It's just instant and is gone in the next moment. But the long-term investment, that lasts forever. And so as we give it away, we gain, as Paul's talking about here, which is the church. He shares on behalf of his body in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out, carry out the preaching of the word of God. Paul's been set apart to be made a minister and just a steward to bless the church. That's Paul's purpose. And we each have our own purpose. And it's not doing what Paul did exactly. We're not going into Turkey or going into ancient Macedonia and preaching the word and being tent makers. Paul's purpose and Paul's, what God has made Paul to do is what God made Paul to do. What we do is what God has made us to do and how he has brought us through this life, our testimony, all the trials, everything we faced, God will use for us to bless the church and to bless the world. Where we are is where God will use us. There's no place we have to go, no status we have to achieve, and no example we need to compare ourselves to except for Jesus because none of them matter except for what we give to God and where he has placed us. The experiences we have, whether they're good or bad, because the bad ones he can redeem for his glory. Just like a, a friend I know who God redeemed his addictions and he's now ministering to other people that also have those addictions, showing them that he found freedom in Jesus. So the good and the bad God will use to redeem us and use us to be a minister and to grow his church. And so we walk in that understanding that we look forward to heaven. We walk now by the spirit and by the redemption of Jesus. We walk in his plan for our lives and the church is grown by it. We give of ourselves and we're not afraid of suffering for the sake of the church. Yeah, this is a really cool and really filling chapter for our spirits to understand Jesus's will for our lives. So, Grandpa? 
Well, this, I, I hate to say this again. This is one of my favorite passages. <laughs> and from verse 13. Verse 13 to me is, is so important to the church. And I realize it, it may be a little difficult to understand when he talks about, you know, visible and invisible. And, and Scott, you know, said it right. You know, he's not talking about physical things. Jesus is the expressed image of God. In other words, the nature of God. So um, there's this, you all know a little bit about C.S. Lewis. And he wrote a book called Screw Tape Letters. And about how, it, you know, it's a backwards. You know, he talks about Satan and working with Wormwood and all these guys, the devils. Well, C.S. Lewis took a lot of this from this passage and then from Ephesians chapter six, that's where he got his thesis. And when he talked about rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, all this is going on constantly. And we're in the midst of, you know, we, we talked about yesterday, we're aliens, you know, we're, we're strangers in this world. We, we're really from another kingdom now. We, we got allegiance to, some kingdom outside this world kingdom that is growing in this kingdom. But some of the part that I just want to emphasize, and there's so much here, I, I think we need, we need to circle this passage and read it over and over because this keeps us right. This is what we call Christology. This is the theology of Jesus. And it, it it's so good to help us understand he's before all things. He just wasn't developed or like some of the early people thought, you know, well, he became God. Or no, he was God, but not man. All this problem, he is the God-man. He emptied himself, as Paul said in, in Philippians. But we came into this, this incredible passage. All things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. I, I once heard one of the most astute professors today that he would be recognized at all the universities he teaches at harvard and everything else but he he was questioned by someone who was not a christian but he began to think well you know how, why do you believe this you know how did everything start you know well he said this astute professor said well well he said i think what a little protosola and a little pond you know somehow it began to develop it you know and then and, and you begin to think you don't really believe that, do you? I mean, that's what this guy says. He says, well, he said, it may have been there was aliens from another world that came in and seeded the, you begin to think they're out of their gourd, you know, of their mind. Paul said it so clearly, Jesus created all things. All things hold together. I mean, the world system are all together in him, the word of his power. So to me, that's so much easier to believe. And I realize it takes some faith. I think they have to have more faith than we do. But Paul says it so clearly here. He is the head of the body, the church. You know, firstborn from the dead. He himself had become first place in everything. Jesus is all in all. He's everything we need. And when you heard your pastor say it, and me and many other Christian ministers, Jesus is the answer of everything. Now, people kind of say, well, what does that mean? Well, if you search him, seek him, the answers are in Jesus. He has all authority, all power, and he rules over all, all Satan's kingdom. Even though we may have been born in sin, now he has authority. We've aligned ourselves in the kingdom of God, and so we walk with him. So... I just think this, I love this passage, and I'm glad we get to talk about it again. We love all the passages, but you know, it's the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. Jesus is all we need, friends. You know, if the world would just believe that to solve the problems of the world, Christ can do that, and he does it through the church, and that's what we do, we're the hands of the Lord as we minister. And so take heart, you get to do the good stuff. <laughs> you don't have to believe all, all these other things which are, are really, some of them off the wall, excuse me. But I mean, they're not reasonable. I mean, they're, they're, 
you have to have more faith to believe in them than you have to have faith and believe in God, I think. So Paul says it so clearly for us. And so we're going to rejoice in that. It's the good pleasure of God. So we Christians rejoice in all of this. So excuse me, <laughs> just this is one of those kind of passages that really cranks my motor. <laughs> Stop there, Scott. Okay, beautiful. Let's pray. We'll go over to the breakout room. Father, uh, tremendous Christology truths teaching us about who you are, revealing yourself to us. Without this word, we would have no clue. We wouldn't understand. Yeah. But Lord, we we can understand because of what you're bringing to us here. We could know you, Lord God, and we love that. So thank you for this chapter and um, that we could, we could recognize uh, you're the creator, you're our Lord, you're mm -hmm. our redeemer, and you have, have, have loved us always and will always love us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, we're going to switch over to the other side, go to a breakout room. Nice being together with you. For those who can't come, we'll see you tomorrow. And uh, have a great rest of the day. God bless you. Bye.